So that's who they are. Uh, no doubt, you know, this was superfluous because they're already so familiar with them, but I felt obliged to run it down anyway. So, Dean, let's kick it off here. Tell us a little bit about the thesis of your book. When you talk about loser liberalism, what on earth do you mean? Good question. Um, in case people didn't see, you got to see the uh, postcard because that tells it all to you. Um, the little poodle. Actually, it's Bichon, and we're abusing it's my, it's, it. It's our dog. Um, and you get copies. You can also download on the website for free, but we have copies here, which you can get. Anyhow, the basic story, uh, the criticism I make in loser liberalism is that I, I argue that liberals, progressive, to a very large extent, have basically embraced the story that's told by the right. And the story that's told by the right is that they like free markets, and that liberals, uh, progressives, want the government to intervene. So the argument is that on one hand we have the conservatives, the right, who want to have the free market, every person for themselves, chips fall where they may, and then you have the loser liberals who say, hey, wait a second, you know, that didn't work out real well, we're going to take some money from the winners and give it to the losers. And that's the idea of loser liberalism. And I think that's like totally wrong in terms of describing the world, it leads to incredibly bad policy, and it leads to even worse policy, politics. What I argue in the book is that it isn't that the right is for the free market. That's, that's garbage. They want to pretend they're for the free market. In fact, what they've been about is rigging the game. What they've done is use the government to structure the market in ways that have the effect of distributing income upward. And what I'm arguing in the book is that we should play the same game, but the other way. Our war is not with the market. Our war is in how we structure the market. What we should, we should want to do is structure the market in ways that have the effect of ensuring that the bulk of the population gets the benefits of growth, the productivity, not just a very small share. So our argument isn't about tax and transfer policy. We care about that. That could be important. But that's really secondary. 90% of the game is before tax income, not after. And we've really lost the game, lost the argument, I would say, if we restrict ourselves to tra tax and transfer policy. Dean, uh Talk a little bit more about this idea that conservatives aren't really for the free market. Give us some examples of some of the egregious things they've supported uh, that really contravene that supposedly sacred principle of theirs. Well, they're all over the place. The most obvious is one we've seen very recently is the, is, is the bank bailouts. So how many conservatives were out there yelling? You give some Tea Party people their credit, but how many conservatives were out there yelling, let J.P. Morgan go under, let Citigroup go under, let Goldman Sachs, I didn't see those people doing that. President Bush was out there saying, if we don't get, you know, if we don't give them all the money we have, we're going to have a second Great Depression, which of course is not true, by the way. But they were saying, they were saying we have to bail out the banks. More generally, let's just step back for a moment. We have too big to fail banks. Many of you have probably seen Simon Johnson, the former uh, chief economist at the IMF. He, he goes around the country. He, he talks to audiences, a lot of business audiences. He goes, how many of you think the government would let Goldman Sachs go under? And of course, no one ever raises their hand. And the point here is that Goldman Sachs is, you know, they're really sharp guys, you know, they're doing this and that, they're taking ri risky bets, and at the end of the day, if they lose, they're counting on the U.S. government to bail them out. That's a subsidy. Okay, so if we allow too big to fail banks to exist, we're subsidizing them. And I did some calculations, other people have done the same thing. It comes on the order of 60 billion a year in subsidies to the country's largest banks. That's not free market, that's government policy. I'll just give you a couple other quick examples. You have to read the book to get the whole set. But prescription drugs, we have these big arguments, you know, we should pay less for prescription drugs. And then we get the, the conservatives tell us, no, no, you don't want to interfere with the free market. No. The only reason prescription drugs are expensive is because we do interfere with the free market. We give drug companies, we give Pfizer and most cat monopolies. So if I want to make a copy of Pfizer's latest drug, you know, I'm going to do it in my bathtub and sell it, they'll put me in jail. That's a patent monopoly. That's government intervention. There's an argument for that. I know that's the way they finance research. There's other ways to finance research. But that's not the free market. Okay, so we spend $300 billion a year on prescription drugs that probably costs about $30 billion a year in a, in a free market. That's a $270 billion difference. That's five times Bush's tax cuts to the wealthy. Okay, no one talks about that, though. Okay, so that, that's, that's how they structured the market, ensures that Pfizer and Merck make lots of money, ensures that the rest of us pay a lot for our drugs. I'll just take one more, it's a big thing, but just a, you know, in passing, that our, our whole trade policy was quite deliberately structured to put downward pressure on the wages of less educated workers. We deliberately put manufacturing workers in competition with low-paid workers in Mexico, China, and elsewhere in the world. 
in both theory and reality, that lowers the wages of manufacturing workers. Sometimes people say, well, NAFTA didn't work. No, that's what NAFTA was supposed to do. That was the textbook. That's not, you know, some crazy liberal lefty. That's what the textbook says. It's supposed to bring down the wages of manufacturing workers. And damage did that. Okay, we didn't have to structure trade that way. It's not a question of free trade. If we want free trade, we could say, hey, what are the obstacles that prevent doctors from coming in from India? What are the obstacles that prevent lawyers from coming in from wherever? We can have free trade in highly paid professionals. We don't do that because highly paid professionals have a lot more power than auto workers. The line I always love is that the difference between auto workers and economists is that auto workers are smart enough to know they need protection but don't have the power to get it. Economists are too dumb to know they need protection but have the power to get it. So that's the basic story. Okay, uh, well let's bring you in here, Jared. What, what do you think of uh, Dean's basic thesis? Um, and uh, is he leaving anything out? I mean, is this really, how central is this, this problem that he's identified? Is it as serious as he said? Um, he's, I don't think Dean is leaving much out. I think it's as serious as he says. And, uh, you know, this isn't going to be uh, much of a debate. Uh, uh, um, so you're saying it's like a quote. Yeah, I, there, there's a few things I, I want to raise, a couple of questions and some disagreements and emphasis. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I've been working with this guy for 20 years. We've written books together, so um, uh, I think he's right. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, we can't disagree. Sure, of course. Um, well, let me amplify a couple of points, and then it's, I, I want to ask Dean to flesh something out. Um, I remember once being at a <coughs> Uh, meeting with a bunch. I think one of the most distorted debates in this town is on trade, and that's a very high bar. Uh, I, I've been to uh, numerous. I've been I've been trying to delve more and more into uh, that uh, that topic, and I've been to lots of meetings lately um, and, and and presentations, oftentimes with representatives, uh, not like you know Dean and myself, but people on the boards of multinationals and things like that. It was actually a very useful thing to do. To, to mix it up a little bit, um, and uh, it's uh, it, it's really it's really quite uh, uh, telling and ironic. Oftentimes, people like Dean and myself are advocating for freer trade. Uh, if you, for example, argue that you think currency rates ought to be set in markets and not uh, by uh, mercantilist exporters who uh, want to have an exporting edge, so they. Uh, uh, make sure their uh, currency makes them more competitive. That's a free trade argument. And I was on a panel the other day with a bunch of kind of mainstream types, and I made this argument, and 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 they said, well, okay, but that's protectionism. So it's exactly upside down. Uh, and um, and and I think that that. So, so I just want to kind of amplify by that point. Um, one one question and one challenge to Dean. The question is on the path. He, he writes. Dean has always um, made an argument against against this uh, government uh, uh, monopoly on patents. And what I think, and, and I, I, I uh, what, what I'd like you to flesh out a little bit more here, if you would, you alluded to it just in passing, is uh, what's the counter argument to the contention that if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have as much innovation because innovators wouldn't be able to recoup the profits that the patent uh, delivers to them. I mean, you, you, have to, you have to offer something else in that regard. The only, and he, so, so then the only kind of, I don't know if this is a critique or what, but just to clarify, I mean, if you read Dean's book, as I did, and I, and I frankly loved it, um, uh, you, will, you, you, you will be somewhat seduced into thinking this is an argument for free market economics. And to some extent, that's in there. But in fact, it's not that you want the market to be free and unfettered in some sort of Adam Smithian sense, I don't think. And by the way, Adam Smith's free market had a recognition of lots of market failures. So people like Greenspan and the rational expectation is, went, went way beyond Adam Smith. So they're, they're not really in touch with the founders of, of capitalism either. But it's not that you really, it's not that I think you really want you know, free markets for real. I think that you want the market structures, you kind of alluded to that just now, I think you want the market structures to uh, either favor or be tilted or at least um, uh, work better for a different group of people. And so, you know, the tone of the book is often like, hey, I'm a big free marketeer, but really, you know, maybe not so much. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, good questions. 
Uh, first off, on, on drugs, yes, absolutely. The argument's right. I mean, we need a way to support research. We have that. We already spend $30 billion a year on biomedical research through the National Institutes of Health. So I always have a great time when people go, oh, you want the government to go, well, sorry, buddy, you missed that the government is doing this in a really big way. So most of that research, not all of it, because you've actually had a lot of drugs, uh, um, forgetting what the first big HIV drug, um, ACT, that was largely developed through, that was developed as a cancer drug uh, through NIH. But most of the research is more basic, and that's by design. And the drug industry goes to the lobby for it every year. They say it's great research, this and that. They go, okay, well, suppose that you were to have the government, and they don't have to do it directly. They can contract it out, which is actually what I would prefer. They could contract out the, the research with, they could even pay Pfizer for it. The point would be that all the results would be in the public domain. I mean that in two ways. One, that whenever you've got a patent, that's in the public domain, so it's produced in a, in a free market, just like, you know, the beer we're getting or whatever, you know, that's, you know, every, everything's produced and competitive in a free market, no patents, no patent monopoly. But the other thing, and this is tremendously important with prescription drugs, all the results, all the test results would be in the public domain. So we would be able to see, there's, you know, you don't, usually don't have to read a month or so without seeing a scandal with Pfizer or Merck or the other big drug companies concealing their test results for the obvious reasons. Let's stick with this for a minute. I'm not totally clear on, on, on your response. I'm starting to get it, and I want you to just say more about it. I mean, what is it that, it, 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 the, the vision of the, the person who would be arguing against you here, against us really, is, and I want you to clarify this one, is that really, if you get rid of the patent monopoly, and you move to a government subsidy, you're going to dampen the innovation. There's some innovator out there, whether it's somebody um, doing research for a drug, or for that matter, you know, Steve Jobs in, in, in his garage, you know, building a, a, a new computer architecture, or, you know, a grunge band that's like trying to figure out the, the next hit, that absent some way to protect their profitability, they won't do it. So, say more about why that's wrong. All right, well, a couple things. First off, I'm focusing on prescription drugs because prescription drugs are somewhat unique in this respect. The patent is the price. So, when you're talking about some of the new cancer drugs could sell for, a uh, dosage could sell for tens of thousands, some are literally in the hundreds of thousands, I'm not making this up. You know, some of the new cancer drugs, they cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. The patent is the price. It's very rare that these drugs are actually expensive to produce. That's not true with patents more generally. Now, there's other issues. So, there, you know, there's every time you know um, Apple or any company comes out with a new product, invariably they're patent suits. So, there's a lot of issues with patents more generally. But it's particularly egregious with drugs. The patent is the price there. Now, in terms of the argument that somehow you stifle innovation, it's you kind of have to have the curse of government money here. Because again, you're, I'm totally happy with the system when you say, okay, here's our pot of money. The drug companies do roughly 40 billion, maybe 50 billion, depending how you count it, of research a year. A lot of it's garbage. But let's say, you know, you just cough. I, I'm saying, I, you know, that's me too drugs, market and stuff. But look, ignore that. Just say you, you, you got 50 billion a year out of that. You contract out with, as I say, it could be Pfizer, it could be Merck, doesn't matter, 10 years, you know, long term contracts. And then they figure out how to incent people to innovate, and they could do the same thing they do now. And also, what I would suggest is you have a silver <coughs> prize fund that awards outstanding innovations. You know, so someone comes up with a great breakthrough to help treat AIDS or some other disease, give that person 10 million bucks. I mean, there's no reason on earth that you wouldn't have people getting enormous incentives to do socially productive innovations in this system. As it stands now, you know, you have a lot of people that do great innovations and they may well not be the person who's rewarded. There's no guarantee. If you're working on a contract with Pfizer and you know you come up with some great new drug that's going to save millions of lives, you can pat you on the back and go, "Great job!" You know, we'll give you a Christmas bonus. You know, they're not obligated to give you. You know, so you know, obviously, if you're a really shrewd person, what you'll do is you quit your job with Pfizer and then you go off and get the patent and hope they don't catch you. And you know, people do that, but that's not what we want to encourage our scientists to do. We want to encourage them to be scientists, and that's not what's happening now. So speak to this other question about the free market here. Yeah, well with that, well two things I'll say on that. One is no, no, I'm not a free market here in the sense that a free market uber is. No, that's absurd. You know, the point is we structure markets and we have to recognize that. And you can structure them in ways that redistribute income upward as we've been doing, or you can structure them in ways that benefit the broad population. And that's what I want to do. Now the one thing I will say, and I, I, this is something I've learned in DC, I learned to shut up occasionally. 
Um, one, of, one of the, uh, I never noticed that, I know, what I was going to say, thank you. Uh, one of the people I used to debate a lot, uh, Bill Niskainen, who was the former uh, chair or president of, of Cato, who uh, unfortunately just recently died, I think it was last week. Um, very conservative guy, very libertarian, but an honest person. And I don't know how many times I debated him, and I, I learned to listen to what he had to say, and I, again, usually disagree with him, but one of the points he made, you know, very often if the market's doing something, there's a reason for it. So kind of my attitude is, well, if you could do something with the market, that's probably the best way to do it. You know, we have things we want to do, we want to make sure. We want to make sure everyone's decent health care. market's not going to do that. You know, we want to make sure, we want to guarantee that everyone who's spent their life working has, you know, some decent standard of living in retirement. Market's not going to do that. There's a lot of things we can go down the list. Market's not going to do that. But if we could find things where we can do it through the market, it's much better to have the market do it than try to jury rig something, you know, and hope that will come out right. So you have to do that. But if you can have the market do it for you, it's certainly much better. Uh, Dean, thanks. Thanks for coming again. I, I really enjoyed the book as well. I've been uh, passing it around. I, I, you know, I studied political theory and elections, so uh, some of the chapters on the Fed policy um, were a little. Um, it's hard to determine what the progressive position on the Fed should be or how you should look at it. And one of the things you call for is looser monetary policy and a weaker, weaker dollar, which it seems like we kind of have some of that now. We don't have a whole lot of employment and we have all, all sorts of problems. But could you tease out for us your perspective on how p progressives should think about the Federal Reserve as an institution, which is deeply undemocratic in many ways? Um, uh, and what it should be doing, how we should think about it. You know, there's all sorts of splits. You also talk about the housing bubble, and it's my understanding that the housing bubble was driven a lot by by loose Fed policy in some ways, or at least that was the hit on Greenspan. And so, can you can you try and explain some of this? How we should understand Fed policy uh, from a progressive point of view? I think I was the one who made that hit on Greenspan. Um, the Okay, a few things. The Fed is enormously important. Part of the story, let me just go back to the dollar, because Jared raised a very important point. I mean, having an overvalued dollar directly disadvantages workers who are subject to international competition. And this is free market, too. I mean, we have, you know, just as Jared was saying, we have a system ostensibly of floating exchange rates. So we have a really large trade deficit. What's supposed to happen in a system of floating exchange rates when you have a really large trade deficit? Your currency is supposed to fall. Well, that's not happening because of conscious decisions by other governments. I don't mean to demonize them. They have reasons for that, and we're partly to blame. That's a long story. But the point is that we're not seeing the market outcome, and by virtue of us not seeing that market outcome of a lower dollar, it's come down a little bit, but I should point out it's really just back to where it was at its pre-crisis level. We dollar soared as the flight to safety with the financial crisis, pretty much back to where we were. We have a long way to go in terms of getting where we should be. But what that directly does is disadvantage manufacturing workers, workers that are subject to international competition. It benefits people who are looking to invest abroad. So if you're a company looking to invest overseas, you're very happy about that. Um, Walmart's very happy. They have all these you know, supply chains with China, very low cost producers. They don't want to see the dollar fall. Um, I should also point out, you know, if you take trips to Europe, you're probably happy about a high dollar too. You know? So, so there, there's benefits from a high dollar, but in it, it ends up disadvantaging the broad segment of the population. It's a very it's, it's a very important distributive policy that I think people just don't recognize. And probably more important than just about anyone you can think of. Now in terms of the Fed, um, first off, first thing we should do is bring the Fed into political debate. You, you might recall when Governor Perry first announced uh, for president, he made some speech where he said, well, Ben Bernanke's going to base the currency, he better not come to Texas because he won't be treated well. And, and people jumped on him. And, and, you know, no, you don't go around threatening the Fed chair that you're going to string them up. That's stupid. And, and also, it's not debasing the currency. Bernanke was actually doing the right thing. He was, he was doing quantitative easing. Good policy, given that we have 9% unemployment. Now, what he was criticized for was the wrong thing, was that he was criticizing the Fed. Totally appropriate for a person running for president saying, I don't like the policies that the current Fed's pursuing, the Fed chair. I'm going to appoint people who are going to do a different policy. That's totally appropriate. We should be debating Fed policy. This idea that some sort of church, that we're just going to have Bernanke and or whoever means to sit down and pronounce from on high, that's crazy. The Fed is an agency created by Congress. It's answerable to Congress. It absolutely should be part of the political debate. And I've had arguments with people that go, oh, you want Congress to set interest rates? No. Same sort of thing with the Food and Drug Administration. The Food and Drug Administration decides which drugs get approved. 
If they go five years and they don't approve any drugs, well, damn right. We should be having Congress on their, you know, on their heels going, what's, what's going on here? How come you're not approving any drugs? Or conversely, approving drugs and people are dying all the time because they're not safe. Again, Congress has oversight. They have to be answerable. But no, we want on a day-to-day -day basis, of course. I want the Fed determining interest rate policy. But that should be in a context laid down by Congress. Now, in terms of the general policy, we've had, we, we have low interest rates. I would argue we need more aggressive policy because there's no downside to it. And one of the things is actually something Bernanke proposed. Well, dates improvement, but Bernanke wrote a piece of the same vein when he's still a professor at Princeton, deliberately targeted a somewhat higher rate of inflation. Um, that would be beneficial for two reasons. One, if you had a somewhat higher rate of inflation, we would expect prices in general rise with inflation, including house prices. It helped people get out from under debt. So if we had 3 or 4%, I'm not talking 20, 50%, probably moderately higher inflation. Um, I think that would be a great thing to have that. The other reason is that it would help spur investment, so that if it, it, you know, firms are thinking of you know, starting a new line of software, or building a factory, whatever it might be, and they know that come four years from now, five years from now, prices will be 16, 20% higher, it would make that a much, much more profitable investment. So the problem is interest rates are already pretty much as low as they can go. How can you raise, raise the, lower the real interest rate, raise prices relative to interest rates, well, somewhat higher inflation. Now in terms of Greenspan and the bubble, and, you know, again, I, I think I was probably going to make this criticism more than anyone. He was right to have low interest rates. He was wrong to ignore the bubble. Okay, so what he should have done is gone after the bubble every way he could. At the end of the day, if he did everything he could, which I would say first and foremost, talk about it, present evidence. There was a bubble. I was writing about this. They have a lot of comments in the Fed. They have all been writing about this. He should have done everything he could to burst the bubble before it got so large and so dangerous. But at the end of the day, if he tried everything, his regulatory authority, he has enormous regulatory authority. If he tried everything, everything in his arsenal and still couldn't burst the bubble, then yeah, you raise interest rates. But I think the, the point was that low interest rate policy were the right thing to do given that the economy was actually very weak in 03, 04, 05. But, you know, he should have been where, he should have been attuned to there being a bubble. It was in D.C. A couple of comments about that. Um, you know, John, um, one answer to, you know, my answer, my answer to your question would be that the way for progressives to think about the Federal Reserve has a lot to do with their, quote, dual mandate. Uh, they're supposed to be, um, uh, striving for low inflation and full employment. And the argument against the Fed is that for too many years, uh, they favored the low inflation part of that mandate uh, relative to the unemployment. And that's a real class bias. Because um, high, high inflation uh, is uh, a much bigger problem if you're someone whose income <coughs> largely derives from all your assets because that, uh, inflation erodes the value of your assets, where is if you're you know, a, a working bum who depends on their paycheck, um, obviously high unemployment is a problem for you. And it's not just a problem for you um, uh, because you either have a job or you don't. In fact, I would argue that's uh, uh, the least of it in normal times. It's much more of a problem from the perspective of, of, of actual pressure in the labor market. Uh, the, the kind of pressure, which is good, that incentivizes employers to bid the wages uh, and the compensation of workers up to get and keep the workers they need. This is called full employment. And it is a very much a mandate uh, of the Federal Reserve. And in fact, Dean and I wrote a book called The Benefits of Full Employment. Uh, if you look back to the last time, uh, really the only time in the past three decades, where the incomes of middle and low, low income people actually rose, the, the rate of economic growth, and you'll find it was when the economy was a truly at full employment in the, in the latter 1990s. And a point that I was going to make, and Dean kind of made it, was um, I got to give some credit for that. Because at the time, people said the, the unemployment rate uh, that uh, uh, under which you go at great risk to uh, uh, accelerating inflation is 6%. You can't go below 6%, Mr. Fed Chairman, because if you do, terrible things will happen to inflation. And he uh, recognized that, that in fact, uh, you, you probably could. It had to do with, uh, uh, it had something to do with productivity acceleration and some other external shocks that were going on. But Dean's right, I and mean, at the same time, and so, so that, that, that's to his credit, at the same time he obviously presided over a very terrible and damaging bubble. One final point on, on this. Um, I've heard lots of people, and I've made the same argument myself at times, argue uh, for more, um, uh, higher inflation targeting by the Fed. And I actually think it makes sense uh, in the spirit that Dean 
talked about lowering real interest rates. Remember, the real interest rate is the nominal rate minus inflation, so lowering real interest rates. You can't lower the nominal rate once it's a zero, but you can lower the real rate uh, by having cost for inflation. However, however, I think people like us have to contend with something that you haven't heard, which is that the current inflation rate is about 4%. Now, that's overall inflation. It includes volatile food and energy, and the, the inflation that the Fed is targeting is core inflation, and that's in very safe range, 2%. I mean, the, the, all this stuff about the Fed pushing harder makes sense based on inflation. But real paychecks are falling. I mean, middle class people are losing ground pretty quickly in terms of their income. And faster inflation would, would mean that their real paychecks and real incomes would fall even faster. So I am not totally ready to sign up for that program. Uh, Dean, if you want to respond to that in just a second. Just one quick follow up on the Fed issue. I mean, again, the, the kind of strange political history of the Fed is that it's both the creature of the banks and it has this public mandate. Is there any any suggestion you have to get rid of it being as, as strong a creature of the banks uh, as it has been in the past and make it much more of a public entity for full employment and the types of things that progressives care about? Yeah, good question. Let me just follow up on that. I, I, I think there is a lot of evidence that wages tend to follow the actual rate of inflation so that if we did see higher rates of inflation, that's always still 2% nominal wage growth even when we have 9% unemployment because people have an expectation, both employers and employees have an expectation of inflation. Three and a half. Of course, because we have 9% unemployment. Um, but that, the point is we still have a positive rate of nominal wage growth. So my expectation would be that if we were to see the inflation rate go to 3 or 4%, the, not, the core inflation rate rise by 1 or 2 percentage points, we would see wages on average. Now, again, important qualification. Doesn't mean that's going to happen for everyone. So there will be losers. But you know, the reality is you know, we don't have a policy. If anyone thinks they have a policy that doesn't have losers, they haven't thought about it enough. Um, we don't have those policies. So. You know, so, so that's going to be on that. Now, in terms of the Fed, again, you know, one of the things people very, very few people understand the structure of the Fed. I frankly didn't fully understand until I came down here because it's so, so obtuse. But the, the you have the decision making body. The key decision making body is the Open Market Committee. They're the ones that you know when Bernanke says he wants that quantitative easing where he wants to keep the rate at zero, whatever. You have twelve people on the Open Market Committee, twelve voting members of the Open Market Committee. Seven of these are appointed by the president, approved by Congress, and they serve in principle up to 14 years, 14 year terms. At the moment there's only five, there's two vacancies. In principle, there's seven. Now, the other five voting members are regional bank presidents. There's actually 12 regional bank presidents, and they all sit on the meetings. There's only five who are voting at any point in time. It always includes the New York Fed, and then the other four rotate. Now, those regional bank presidents are appointed through a complex process. But for practical purposes, no one's going to dispute they're basically appointed by the banks. And it's kind of mind-boggling to me, like, why on earth would you have banks decide the people who regulate the banking industry? It'd be like giving Pfizer and Merck seats on the Federal Food and Drug Administration. And, you know, I know there's corruption there, there's lobbying and everything, but they don't, they have to lobby. They don't, they don't literally have people already there, you know, and they, but the banks do. And that's incredibly, to my mind, undemocratic. I mean, you know, we want a central bank. Why isn't it answerable to the democratically elected government? Now, Bernie Sanders, literally just before I came here, he's working on a bill. I don't know where this will stay and where it will go, but he's working on a bill to reform the Fed with the idea, quite explicitly, that everyone who's deciding policy is appointed by the president, approved by Congress. Barney Frank actually has proposed a bill for the same thing. So there's lots of ways you could restructure the Fed. You know, who knows which one's the best. But it seems to me the basic idea that it's this is a governmental agency, it should be appointed by democratically elected officials. I think that's hard to argue with. Um, let, me, let me touch on one of the I think the, the main themes of your book, which is that um, you know that, that relates to a lot of the stuff you talked about. But the rest is why they're talking about the wrong things. They wind up putting themselves in a box when they're talking about just tax and spend, or uh, the government should do stuff rather than making markets work in the fashion you described, a progressive fashion. They don't talk about the Fed, they don't talk about uh, some other things. Um, how much juice is there really there for turning the progressive movement around? Because when I, I think about the things that progressives argue about, the really big things, the really big problems, they do have to do with government spending. I mean, if you're going to fix the infrastructure of this country over the long term, it requires a lot of money if you're going to invest in the human capital infrastructure of the country, it's, it takes a lot of money. The debates that are taking place in Congress right now around the budget are about money. They're about fiscal priorities. 
And it's not clear to me that your perspective, however loose and embracing as it is in many respects, really unlocks that in a way that, that helps progressives that directly. Well, I think seeing those as the main priorities for progressives is somewhat misleading because, you know, right now we could, you know, have our dreams about infrastructure. I think mean, you could comb that, put that together with stimulus, but, it, it, but let's for the moment just say we're going to improve infrastructure and not talk about a stimulus. We have to, you know, find some evil spending bill who is evil spending. We don't have to say the military, but, you know, in any case, you know, you know we're going to have a deficit neutral increase in spending or uh, increase in spending infrastructure, education, things that we might all agree are good things, uh, we would still have 9% unemployment. We have to deal with the macro issues. And that talks about the Fed, that talks about the dollar, the overvalued dollar. When we get, if we get back to full employment, you know, if we go back to the good old days, uh, you have money. So it's much easier to get money in a context where you're someone near full employment. Um, so I think that we get to this crisis, you know, we're sitting here with the super committee trying to debate how much they should cut Medicare and Social Security versus, you know, these explicitly poor people's programs. You know, that's really a horrible losing situation. If we had the economy back at four and a half percent on a we wouldn't have large deficits, so we wouldn't be screaming about every last hour. Yeah, I, I've thought about this question too. I like the way you framed it. And Coming off of Dean's book, I think I have uh, an answer to the question that I like a little bit better than Dean's answer. Uh, which is, I mean, you know, I, I agree with Dean's answer, he wrote the book, but I took something else from the book um, that I thought was very profound, which you didn't quite just say, or at least you didn't say it in a way that I wanted you to. Um, the thing we suffer from, it, look, people like you and me and our little, you know, armies, leading this parade that like not enough people are marching behind. You know, you're familiar with what I'm talking about. Yeah. We may well have all the arguments you're describing. We've had them for the last 20 years. Frankly, we've been getting our asses kicked consistently. Um, the, to me, one of the most profound messages of Dean's book is that there will never be the kind of parade behind us, the kind of support for the government spending, the government intervention, the good government that we want to need if the economy is broken. If the economy doesn't work for middle class people, if it doesn't create the jobs they need, the quality of the jobs they need, if it doesn't create a vibrant manufacturing sector, if it doesn't distribute the benefits of growth more equitably, if it doesn't do any of those things, and it won't do those things if we don't correct the, the um, imbalances that Dean writes about, then what you're going to be stuck with is not just market failure, but government failure in the minds of uh, the broad populace. They'll be like, why should I, I, am, I, my, I you know, my, my, media, my income, you know, middle class, middle class income took a terrible hit during the expansion of the 2000s, not the recession, you know this, of the expansion before the recession. Why should I send any one penny of my hard earned dollars to Washington, D.C. so they can be pissed away by some boondoggle congressman who wants to rake leaves on the mall, you know, when, when we desperately need these things. So, so I think there's a sequencing here that Dean has hit on in his book. The sequencing is that we have to make markets work for people. And then we can make an argument that um, there's a government out there that can make a positive difference in your lives. Uh, as long as the government uh, is broken and uh, people are disconnected from, from the market and from growth, we're kind of stuck. So in a sense, it's sort of, your argument, as I take it, is it's sort of the reinventing government of the left. The reinventing, go reinventing government is really successful because the whole rationale for the whole reinventing government um, thing in the 90s was that people don't trust government, so we have to make government work better, we got to streamline the bureaucracies, and then everyone will love government. Well, that didn't turn out to work so great. And I, I think what you're saying is that we can build on Dean's ideas to, to actually deliver a government that works in a much more material, direct, concrete sense that people will actually, uh, you know, it's glom onto. It's, it's a government that structures markets so that the broad, you know, the bottom 99, so that the broad middle class benefits, not just those at the top. And I think the inherent connections between a government that accomplishes that reconnection of growth and broadly shared prosperity is a government that not only will be supported by more people, but it's a government that finally will be worthy of that support, which the current government is not. 
you know, Jerry put much better than I did, and, and, and that's exactly right. I mean, if you go back, we're both old enough for all of them. We're old enough to remember the 60s, and you know, we had big expansions in government programs, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, we started EPA, OSHA, I mean, there's a long, and you know, a lot of these were actually started by Nixon, you know, Republicans supported these things. You know, and that was that that was doable in a context where people felt things were going well and it was reasonable to say, hey, you know, you have a good job, your wages are rising, your kids are gonna go to college, what else do we need? So it's reasonable to talk about that when you're in a context where everything is contracting, where people feel squeezed, they're going, Well, what can I do? And you know, one thing you always do, well, maybe I can pay less in taxes. You know, and if that's you don't see, you know, if you're feeling squeezed, you don't really see the other doing anything for you because things are bad, well, you can pay less in taxes. I just want to stick with this for a minute because it's the core of Dean's book, to me anyway, and it's the most important economic insight of our era, in my opinion. And it's not, I'm not, I've, been, I've been trying to say the same thing, so it's, I'm not, I don't want to just kiss Dean's uh, um, posterior. Uh, you know, I'm saying that this is, you know, he, he's, he's, he's stumbled on, you know, this, uh, this kind of grail that a lot of us have been trying to work on. If you're out there in this country and you're maybe outside of the Beltway and you're not sitting at you know a, a, a discussion like this, which by the way, I think discussions like this are really important and they should occur outside the Beltway, and thank you guys for putting this together. And you think, and I ask you, tell me what the federal government does. I guarantee you, you'll say they bail out bankers, they help undeserving people, um, you know, they take too much of my tax dollars, they send jobs overseas, Maybe if you're knowledgeable, you'll say, well, they protect my security a little bit in terms of old age, but they're screwing up at it. They run giant budget deficits. They reward the lobbyists. They're corrupt. And that's because of all the stuff in the chapters in the book that, that just um, give you the anatomy of how the government has structured markets in a way that doesn't work for the broad majority. If that were to be turned around, and the government worked in such a way, such, such that market structures were rewarding to the broad. I, I, get, I, I strongly believe we would have a, a much better argument uh, that we are worthy of the kind of support we're asking for. Let me follow up on that real quickly for both of you. I mean, one thing that's hard to conceptualize or for progressives to get out is what is our alternative vision uh, and framework overall? So you've got the one that most people point to is you know, the great sort of post-war New Deal consensus where you, you know, you had the Great Depression and things were going pretty well um, you know, after the Roosevelt years. Some more centrist Democrats point to the 1990s. You also have um, so the social, various social market economies of Europe as, as kind of models. Um, and they vary, the cooperative labor government business model of Germany or the one where you have more free market um, you know, sort of deregulatory policies, but a huge sort of capturing through the tax system that's redistributed through social welfare policies, and then you have the more authoritarian models of Asia. So what exactly are we, should we be arguing for to do the types of things that Jared, Jared asked? You don't just get cynicism that the whole thing's rigged, the government can't do anything right, the rich are always going to win out, and you know the working class is always going to lose. So what's it look like? Yeah. I think we have to go back to the post-war period, because that is something some people still remember, or at least their parents remember. Someone, you know, they'll, they'll know someone who remembers that, and, and that is a model. I mean, it's a successful model. We can't go exactly back in the sense that, obviously, we're a more globalized economy. Um, we have 30% unionization rate. I'd love to see that, but, you know, I can't imagine, like, that's going to happen anytime soon. Maybe it will. Like, I'm not terribly optimistic that it will. But I think that, that we can hold out as a model. Now, it's not going to look the same. But I think that's, if we want, if people are saying, well, what are you talking about? It's a, it's a situation where, you know, we have two, two and a half percent productivity growth. That's broadly shared. We're increasing the guarantees in society. We certainly did that, you know, going into the 60s with Medicare and Medicaid. That, you know, people can count on, on health care in their old age, you know, so we're increasing the safety net at the same time that everyone is benefiting. So I think that's the sort of model we could talk about. Obviously, I'm not fully fleshing it out. I don't think I could, you know. Part of it is you're, you're going to develop it as you go along. <coughs> Uh, I'm working on exactly this, and I'm not there yet either. But um, let me express the answer to your question in ways that are perhaps less satisfying than you'd like them to be. You ask the right question. It's a good question. Get more granular. Get down to cases. What would it really look like? What are we talking about for people to support? I'm not quite there yet, but I do have a conception 
and maybe someone in the audience can help flesh this out. I think we're going to have Q&A at some point. Um, I do have a concession, but unfortunately it's kind of an economy still. So I'm, this is a work in progress. Um, the current model, let's start from the current model just briefly. The current model is a toxic combination of rational expectations mixed in with trickle-down supply-side economics leavened and seasoned to a toxic boil with, um, with, with, with money. <laughs> By that I mean the rational expectations thing is an economic theory that says markets are self-regulated. They police themselves, they regulate themselves. Price signals, as articulated by the private market, have all the information in them that anybody in the economy needs to make the optimal decision. And that is the thinking that pushed Keynesianism off the stage in the latter 1970s. It pushed off a lot of the stuff that Dean was just advocating for. Marry that with a political economy fraught with power dynamics, fraught with money, uh, with lobbying power, and you have a, and you have this combination of, of 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 an elite academic opinion telling you that less government is better. All the government can do is like screw up the invisible hand. Ma marry that with 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 um, money politics, and you end up with trickle down supply side economics, which fuels this uh, upward redistribution. Uh, I think the first sentence of Dean's book is um, "Money doesn't float up" or something like that. <laughs> money doesn't fall up. Um, so that's that's the that's the old model. I mean, that's and I would argue. I I hoped and thought that when that crappy model exploded in 2007 2008, we would have the wherewithal to build a new model. But I've been wrong about that, and we're still operating within the old model. The new model has to take market failure, market failure at its core. It doesn't mean that markets always fail. It doesn't mean that price signals are always wrong. And in fact, typically markets. Uh, uh, do a lot of stuff right. I agree with uh, Dean's uh, point on this earlier. But there are three funda fundamental ways in which markets fail, and the new model has to deal with them, uh, uh, you know, 24 and 7. And that is in terms of financial regulation, income inequality, and, um, uh, uh, and job creation. Left to its own devices, I am concerned, I, I, left to its own devices, I guarantee you <coughs> financial instability will be a continuing, ongoing characteristic of the modern economy. And the tail risk here, meaning that the small probability of a large explosion is way too dangerous for us to sustain. So I guarantee you that the current model doesn't do enough uh, on financial instability. Two, income inequality, uh, the, mo uh, the, current, the, cur the, the, the new model has to recognize that as a market failure. And three, and I'm not sure about this one, because it's new in the 2000s. Up until the 2000s, we actually did generate at least enough jobs in terms of quantity. But in the 2000s, we have a new problem. We weren't generating enough jobs. So we need a new model built around those three profound market failures. Just quickly throwing in there, you're being way too generous on financial regulation. <laughs> Keep in mind, no one here, or no one here, we might be talking about it. In, what, in, in the capital, no one there is talking about breaking up too big to fail banks. So they don't want deregulation. They want to leave too big to fail banks that are relying on the government guarantee in this. The other part that we should remember, deposit insurance. We all know what that is, FDIC. Okay, you don't see a lot of people yelling they want to get rid of federal government deposit insurance. Now, what does that mean if I could take money from people, I could have it, don't worry about what I'm doing, the government's guaranteeing it, and I can do whatever the hell I want with it. Is that deregulation? That's nuts. So to call that deregulation is totally a misnomer. So we, we have to get this down in English, and that's not what they want. That what they basically want is an insurance policy that they don't have to pay for. Well, a lot on the table here. We could go on and on and on, but we won't, because we want to hear from you, the audience. Why don't we start in the back of the floor? I was curious, Jared, how you think of externalities like, say, CO2 into this model that you're... Uh, I, I was, let me just repeat that because you don't have the mic. I was curious how, how I think externalities like CO2 uh, pollution fit into the model. Um, uh, uh, I absolutely put them at the heart of... I mean, that, that's a well-established market failure externality. Um, uh, so um, even, even classical economists would agree 
that uh, that that's uh, a problem that. Uh, what you're doing is you're talking about externalities and not part of the class of understanding. So I'm going further than that, but I think in, in respect of the gentleman's question, we are at a perilous perilous point, and I'm not trying to be dramatic here. Um, the inability of our current political system to self-correct is truly alarming to me. Truly alarming. I've never seen it quite this shocking. Uh, and um, climate is one of the things that can really keep, keep you up night, uh, keep you up nights worrying about that. Um, I will say, you know, that we, we elected, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean the president, many Democrats in high standing, recognize that we don't solve this until we put a price on carbon. But getting from here to there has been uh, uh, so far possible. Yes. Following up a little bit on the idea of that externality, just to carry on what, 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 what uh, Jared was saying. I mean, this is 100% the market that, in principle, what you, you would want to have happen, I mean, this is totally the market, is that, you know, on the one hand, you incorporate the externality, you know, so you have some sort of tax. So alternatively, you go, okay, the people who are dying in Bangladesh from floods or in Africa from starvation, they could sue the people who put the stuff in the atmosphere that increase, you know, uh, temperatures, change the climate. Now, Matching that up, of course, is very hard to do, but let's imagine that we, you know, we have perfectly traced out and we can figure it out, then you should have a suit. So we'd end up in the same outcome. We would pay a lot of money for destroying the environment in, you know, making a lot of people around the world suffer. Hi. Um, on the cover of USA Today, there was an article about how there's an oversupply of housing that will take possibly many, many, many years to resolve. And you know, estimates are that between seven and eight trillion dollars of wealth disappear in this housing bubble. And I'm always surprised how little discussed it is. What what that how to resolve that continuing drag on recovery, what, what <coughs> any kind of response to that would look like. Can you speak to that please? Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of arithmetic, which unfortunately has very little place in most economic arguments. Um, our, our economy was driven by that bubble prior to the downturn. This is all like 100% mainstream economics. There's something called the wealth effect, which, you know, I learned in grad school, some of the papers date back 20, 30 years. I mean, it's not new. Um, there's a New York Times article about uh, a couple weeks ago where there, the, the guy who wrote it said, oh, economists are talking about the impact of housing on wealth. Like it's a new thing, and you know, it was actually kind of funny because I have a blog, Beat the Press, where I write an economic reporting, and I kind of trashed it. So someone took what I wrote and sent it to the reporter, and the guy was really angry. He goes, "Well, just because Dean Baker says it doesn't mean it's true." So then I went to Google Scholar, and I just sent him the first two pages of articles. You know, they're probably twenty, I and mean, it's just kind of, what are we arguing over here? But anyhow, uh, the point is, we had about eight trillion dollars in housing bubble wealth that was spurring consumption. Um, that's housing wealth effect, the six, six cents on a dollar, people have estimated different numbers, that's the one that seems, to my mind, at least the best support by the evidence. 500 billion a year in consumption, that's gone because people lack the wealth. You hear a lot of articles where people aren't spending because they're pessimistic and blah, blah. I'm sure they are, but the main reason they aren't spending is the reason almost people don't spend, they don't have the money. Okay, they just lost a pile of money. You, you had all this wealth in your home, and you know you didn't think you had to save for retirement. You were borrowing it. It's gone. You can't spend. Okay, so we lost somewhere in the order of 500 billion a year in annual consumption expenditure. The other part of the story is housing prices were going through the roof. All building was going through the roof. We're building at enormous, at very rapid rates. You know, two to oh six. You know, which is why we have this huge oversupply of housing. Because people saw these high house prices, they thought they'd build a home and make a lot. And a lot of people did. You know, and then the music stopped. So we have enormous oversupply of housing. Construction fell by about four percentage points of GDP. That's around 600 billion a year. So you sum those two together, we're looking at the order of 900 billion, perhaps as much as a trillion a year in lost demand. What we're trying to do is fill that hole. And what can you do? Well, in the short term, you know, we could love the market. I love these conservatives. Oh, we want the market. Well, well the market isn't going to create jobs because we want it to. You know, it's you know, no business is going to go out and hire people because we want them to. They'll hire when they see demand, when it makes sense. That's not going to be there now because they don't. We have this big hole in the economy. In the short term, the government has to fill the gap. That's why we should all be celebrating the budget deficit and wishing we had a much bigger one because if we had a smaller one, we'd have more unemployment. Over the longer term, well, the only thing I can see is trade. We we currently have a trade deficit about four percent of GDP. That's six hundred billion a year. If we got that trade deficit closer to zero, 
that would go a very long way towards filling the gap. So I think that you, that point's exactly right. We have this very big gap. We need to fill it. You know, again, we could love private business as much as we want. That's not going to make them invest. It's not going to fill the gap. Short term, all we really have is the government that can do it. Longer term, we have to look to getting the trade deficit down, and that will fill the gap. So, you know, part of what you, I, I, I stipulate to, and agree with uh, everything being said, particularly on the gap fillers, but you kind of also were asking, I think, is there anything we can do about this overhang? And, you know, here I speak to you as a former member of the White House uh, team on housing, um, uh, and I recognize that, you know, that track record is, uh, is not as impressive as uh, some of the initial numbers hoped it would be. So. I come to you somewhat contritely on this point. But there is one idea out there, it's, it, it's a small bore compared to what Dean was talking about, but I like it. Um, you've got to these days, unfortunately, think about things you can do without Congress, because Congress won't cooperate uh, uh, on, on, uh, on issues that will help the economy for the most part. Um, Fannie, Fannie and Freddie, the uh, uh, government-sponsored enterprises that are now largely 80% you know, in conservatorship held by the federal government, uh, Fannie and Freddie have uh, hundreds of thousands of foreclosed properties on their books. Um, the typical procedure here is to sell them to people who want to buy them, including investors, who then put them on the residential market, and it exacerbates the overhang. I like this idea that the White House has espoused and that the regulator of Fannie and Freddie, FHFA, the Federal uh, Housing and Finance Administration, is, is also behind to take those properties and put them on the rental market. Uh, and you can do that without, without the congressional approval. It's, out, it, it's, a, it's an idea that the White House has floated. It's in this commenting stage now where people are allowed to make comments. That's the way these regulations work. Uh, but I actually think that will help diminish some of the uh, housing overhang on the residential market. Let me just, since it's mine, yeah, I gotta say one other thing on that. Um, to my mind, the better view is before it comes on the market, you let the person stay there as a renter. You have the right to rent, which they can do. Fannie and Freddie could, in principle, do with the properties they own that have gone for closure. So instead of you know throwing the person out and then putting on the rental market, let the person stay there as a renter, paying the market rent. Let's get a few more questions. <coughs> I'd like to get your thoughts on how to think about housing policy going forward. In terms of, in the past, for a long time, we thought about uh, the way we uh, promoted wealth creation among minorities and poor communities was to promote housing home ownership. Um, the bubble now may be a reason to rethink that. Think about whether rental housing is something we should be promoting, whether there are other ways to create wealth in minority and poor communities that don't rely so heavily on promoting home ownership, which may not be sustainable as we've learned over the last couple of years. I would certainly like to see us focus on a more balanced housing policy that promotes rentals in many cases and tries to give security to renters. I mean, that's you know that's a big issue. You hear people saying, "Oh, well, you know, they don't want to be renters because you'd be thrown out." It well, it really depends. In New York, for example, you have very good rental laws, so renters have a lot of security. Some would argue too much security, but the point is, you know, renting in New York is not a bad situation. You have a lot of very middle income, up and middle income people that are renters because you know they know their landlord can't just raise the rent when they want; they can't just throw them out. You know, so I think having policies that are oriented towards making renting a better outcome would be a very good idea. The idea that housing, home ownership is a route to wealth, I mean, it really, you know, it, it, it's, it's never been especially true. A lot of people, if they're on a stable job situation, family situation, that you're going to buy a home and then you might have to move in a year or two years. That is not the way to build wealth. It was incredibly painful during the bubble years when you could see people were going to get killed. And you had a lot of community groups that were just encouraging people in 04, 05, and 06, even if they didn't get a subprime mortgage, even if they got a good mortgage, they got killed. And that was easy to see. So this idea that, you know, you just buy a home and that's a ticket to wealth, that's nuts. And, you know, it's really irresponsible for a lot of people to promote it in situations where it made no sense. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I'm a little bit more sympathetic uh, in the following sense. And, um, I, I think, for example, uh, the mortgage interest deduction, which is you know, non-refundable, so it doesn't help low-income people, uh, is largely a, 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 a distortion in very much the sense that Dean was talking about. But there are a set of, there are ways, and, and we very much overdid it in exactly the spirit Dean mentioned, particularly with the subprime slime, 
But there are ways in which um, uh, low-income people, minorities face uh, historical discrimination in housing markets. And it is true that the median wealth for say, African American families is, is about zero. So housing wealth, I think, is, is more is more important. I perhaps think housing wealth is, is more important to them uh, than may, than maybe Dean does. Um, and I think that the F, uh, Federal Housing Administration has historically had good a good set of I think pretty conservative policies to help <coughs> foster home ownership among low income people. And I think that the, it, 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 this is totally separate and apart from the subprime. Craziness, which was, by the way, largely a private sector uh, uh, mistake. So I'm, I'm more sympathetic to the cause, probably. Well, just to be clear, I wouldn't get rid of it. I think the FHA is actually a good example, mostly that's good. And I should also point out one of the, one of the stories that hasn't gotten enough attention as I was talking to someone who reminded me of this. Uh, the FHA historically is about 9, 10% of the market. In other words, it guarantees about 9 or 10% of the loans. It fell to almost zero. It was about 2% at the peak of the bubble, which is exactly what you'd want. You know, that's, that drives home the point. It was not the government pushing people to buy homes. It was, you know, Chase, you know, J.P. Morgan, you know, it was private. In terms of a balanced policy, housing policy, during the last quarter, for the first time in a very long time, the rate of home ownership actually went up on the country. And it was driven primarily by minority households. White households increased by 18,000 units. 18,000 units. For Asians, it was 66,000. For Black households, it was 190,000 in one quarter. For Hispanics, it was 288,000. So my question is, what does this kind of information give you in terms of the fact that when good loans are made, not the uh, defective loan product, but good, affordable, safe, sound loans are made to working, hard families who are responsible? What does it say about the future? Okay, we're we're going to bundle, I think, a bunch of questions together here at this point because we're sort of running out of time. So let's 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 have a number of other questions. Yeah, I, why why do so few economists think like you guys do? Is it, is it Can you say that again? Why, why do so few economists think like you do and advocate the policies that you do? Is it the econ 101 where it's the the invisible <coughs> hand and it's so form formulaic? I don't know if you saw the Harvard student letter to. They just are going to walk out until they get the economic reality, or is it just because economists are want to say what the money interests want to hear? I, I don't understand. Uh, I'm I'm not an economist, and I think what I found powerful, and I'd like you to talk more about, in terms of the progressive agenda. Um, I expected to hear more about the power of definition. It seems like um, we've conceded the definitions of this game to the conservatives. And what you are really talking about is giving us um, new ways to define reality, one, and organize so we can organize ourselves to have the power to enforce those definitions. Um, and the housing market, I think, is one example how much of that bubble was driven by artificial equity? I mean, a lot of that was driven by the fact that a townhouse that sold five years ago for $70,000 in seven years was now worth $300,000. How real was that? Wasn't that where the lie was? And isn't that what we re need to redefine? And maybe, maybe one more question in my mind. Hi, uh, mainstream economists that de uh, declare that the Doha round is a failure. Uh, is that a win for progressives? And does progressives continue to hope for the foundering of the WTO? Or alternatively, is there really a package that could get negotiated that is in the favor of developing nations? And what does that package look like? Okay, guys, go to it. <laughs> um, why don't I take the first step? That's okay. Um, Kind of combining some, look, Dean and I are um, very much in support of good responsible lending. Uh, and I think our point about the FHA, the uh, Federal Housing Administration, which has historically, I think, done a good responsible job of lending to low income and minority households, is a role that we want to keep, keep going. And by the way, this may be arcane, but I'm proud of it. In the White House uh, Treasury HUD white paper that 
we were all alive is still in the administration, we had three different options for housing policies going forward. Every one of those options had a continuing role for the FHA in supporting low-income housing. Um, you know, why are economists uh, so problematic? Uh, I don't know, let me think about that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's yeah. uh, well, we'll think about that. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of questions about housing, the progressive agenda. If it wasn't the housing bubble, it'd be a different bubble. I guarantee you. I mean, I guarantee you, history shows that to be. I mean, I call it the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the shampoo economy, bubble bust repeat. And that's been the, that's been the, that's been the sequencing. And, and, and I'm telling you, you go back to Adam Smith, who a lot of these economists think they're emulating. Adam Smith said, you really have to watch the banks because they'll speculate you know, you into recession every time. There's an economist who's come back into vogue named Hyman Minsky, who, um, you know, understood this better than anyone, and was writing, you know, decades ago that stability in financial markets is destabilized. <laughs> and so if, if that's at the heart of my model, this new model I was, I was emphasizing. Um, you know, the Doha round, uh, I, I take your, it's a good question. Um, my take, it's a longer question than we probably have time to go into. Uh, I mean, my take is that multilateral trade agreements are just too complex for humans to do in any way that's beneficial to any of the players at the table. So I don't have high hopes for that. And I don't know if it's failure is a success for progressives. I, I, I probably wouldn't go that far. I just think I never saw anything in there that made any sense to me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Quick things. Uh, first off, in housing, uh, I saw that data too, and that was encouraging, although I'd caution uh, those numbers tend to jump around a lot, so we might see that reverse next quarter. But, but the basic point, yeah, we want people to have good mortgages, and you know, I, I just sort of struck the reaction of, of the right to Elizabeth Warren. I mean, what, what is she saying? People should be able to get a mortgage they can understand. Like, that's, that's you know, inappropriate regulation, you know, where they're undue burden on banks, and you know, it's kind of nuts in my view. Why on earth would you want people to understand their mortgages, you know? so. That's what we should all want to see, at least in my view. Um, the, the question about economists is a really good one, and you know they walk out by the Harvard students. You know, I, I give these guys on the right a lot of credit. Martin Feldstein was absolutely brilliant. He taught the intro class at Harvard for I don't know probably 30 years. Think about that. Here's this guy, very conservative. You know, I'll give credit. I think he probably believes the stuff he says. If you're at Harvard, you know, you're a bright, ambitious kid at Harvard. You want to go? Oh, econ. What's that about? Martin Feldstein. Okay, so what happens? All the progressives, and I know many who've done this, they go, that's not for me. So you get this great self-selection process. Who goes on? Well, you kind of like Martin Feldstein. He's a cool guy, so who do you end up with? But there really is a lot of that. I mean, I, I didn't have the good fortune or bad fortune of studying on Martin Feldstein, but I certainly saw the same thing in you know, my program. And, you know, not, again, not perhaps as bad as Feldstein, but there's a lot of self-selection there. If you don't like that field, you're going to do something else. So there's a huge role there. And you know, there is a role for corruption. I think that's an exception. If you saw the movie, uh, the movie uh, Inside Job, you know, great, great movie. You know, but, but I think the case is a sort of straight out corruption, someone handing you money to sell your opinion. I think that's really the exception that happens, but I think that's really the exception. Um, the definitions, uh, yeah, you know, we really, I'll tell you, I was infuriated to see Bill Clinton come out with this book, you know, about the economy. I, I, so, you know, I mean, to my mind, Bill Clinton got us seriously on the wrong path. You know, I, I'm delighted, you know, Jerry was talking about the great things we wrote about, it, 96 to 2000. We got the unemployment rate down to 4%, and we saw wage growth. A lot of good things. It was built on a stock bubble. That was going to burst. He should have known that. The high dollar policy. That was Bill Clinton. Robert Rubin and Bill Clinton. So he set us off on a really bad path. I don't want him guiding our future. You know, so also the deregulation of the financial sector. Again, Bill Clinton. So, you know, I, I look at that, there were good things you could say. Even, even the 4% unemployment, you know, Jared alluded to this. Clinton's appointees to the Fed did not want us to do that. It was only because Greenspan was such a weirdo that he was saying, no, I don't see inflation. But any, you know, mainstream economists, including the liberals that Clinton appointed to the Fed, this is public, you know, they've written about this. It's not a secret, you know, they've talked about this. They went to Greenspan, they said, you've got to raise rates. The unemployment rate's getting too low. So that, that was no point. You know, I'm not a big fan. 
Um, the Doha round, I consider it a victory. I mean, look, there's a lot there. We talk about this as free trade. It drives me nuts because if you actually look there, an awful lot of it's about actually increasing regulations. First and foremost, I was talking about drugs. It's a big thing. Patent protection. All our trade agreements increase patent protection. They increase copyright protection. They're about increasing protection, which imposes high costs on our trading partners. There are a lot of things in the Doha round that really have nothing to do with free trade. So I think you could talk about advancing free trade. I don't think the Doha round did it. So if that's dead, I don't know. I mean, it seems to keep coming back to life, but whatever. I don't think that's a loss. Well, um, Dean, Jared, thanks so much for coming. It was, um, we've enjoyed having you in the past, and this was a really lively discussion. I appreciate uh, all of you for coming. Uh, we have one more of these next week on the Youth Agenda for 2012. If you're interested in in politics, please join us for that. And again, you can get the book online, or you can also purchase a hard copy here at the bookstore at Busboys. I encourage all of you to read The End of Blues with Liberalism, Making Markets Progressive. And have a nice evening. Take care.